Welcome to Turning the Tables, Cooking to Thrive in the 21st Century. I'm Maria Reidelbach, and I will be your host. Um, cook, what is Turning the Tables? It's going to be a cookbook with just two dozen master recipes that show how to use fresh food and pantry staples that you already have to cook delicious meals that also have a low carbon footprint and are healthy for the earth. I got involved in this because I'm an artist and an author, and I've been working with local farmers in the Hudson Valley for about 15 years. I, but I love locally grown food. I love to eat. And over the last 15 years, I've become more and more concerned about climate change and the effects that we are already seeing. I discovered that the foods that we eat can have a big impact on uh, our total carbon footprint. And I also learned that changing our kitchen practice can bring huge health benefits to us. So uh, we don't have to change everything all at once. We can check out the options and just change the parts that we like, begin slow and ramp it up. Um, also, Knowing that we're taking action to help reduce climate change means that we're contributing to something greater than ourselves. Amazingly, this also has health benefits. It reduces cardiovascular risk. It even um, adds longevity, reduces depression, um, all kinds of, of great things for our body. And this is science, not making this up. How can we transition to cooking in a more mindfully sustainable way? Well, standard recipes use um, lots of specific ingredients and specific amounts, and uh, often big or little jars of things that uh, we buy once, we use them once, and then they sit in our shelves gathering dust. Um, plus they use, often use lots of dishes and multiple cooking techniques, and they are complicated. Master recipes are basics. They're classic recipes used all over the world. Very creative. They use what you've got on hand, what you've got in your pantry, stuff you grow in the garden, stuff that's on sale, um, even food that you've foraged. And these are simple classic dishes that have stood the test of time. Um, we create less waste from leftover ingredients and packaging, fewer processed foods, uh, which usually have a much bigger carbon footprint than whole foods. So climate smart food is also much better for us than the standard American diet. So we'll be healthy and vibrant for the days and years ahead. Sheet pan dinners, why do we love them? Well, it's because they're simple and they're delicious and it's a wonderful way to use fresh ingredients or ingredients that have been sitting around your fridge for a while. Um, ingredients from your garden, from the farmer's market, maybe you forage them, and really all different kinds of ingredients. It is really surprising all of the things that you can cook on a sheet pan. Lots of inventive cooks around the world have been having so much fun with this cooking method and it has a low cleanup and it's pretty quick and you can be so inventive and you can make food just the way you love it. So um, let's get on with the show. So um, first I wanted to talk a little, just a little bit about what you can cook. You can cook um, according to the seasons. You can cook asparagus in the spring with tofu, mushrooms, wild ramps if you're into foraging. Um, and then you can take the ramp greens and make up an easy uh, oil and herb pesto to serve with your sheep pan dinner. In the summer, everything opens up. There's bell peppers, onions, cherry tomatoes. You can put corn on the cob or off the cob, which tastes so good once it gets a little bit browned. Um, some sausages, 
sunflower oil, make some pesto out of those onion greens, sort of like you did with the ramps. And, uh, and it's delicious. And summer has so many other wonderful vegetables. There are eggplant, there are um, zucchini, all kinds of, of other squash. Uh, it's just endless. Then in the fall, you get some really hearty vegetables coming along. You've got some winter squash, which I love with all the vitamin A, and it's just so, mm, it's just so um, filling and warming. And uh, turnips really come into their own. And um, you can also eat the turnip greens, which is just a bonus vegetable. And greens are so good for you. And you can actually cook greens on a sheet pan. Um, our recipe will show you how. Lots of green herbs, which are really the powerhouses of the plant world. They're sort of the vitamins of the plant world, and yet they're so delicious. I mean, that's the thing about nature, is that food is delicious to us because it's good for us. And that's the way our, our instincts are built. We, we are drawn to the food that is good for us and somehow the plant world just delivers it. Um, also in the winter, um, Brussels sprouts, great winter vegetable, little tiny cabbage heads. A lot of people don't like Brussels sprouts because they have had them overcooked, but wait until you try them roasted. They get all toasty and brown. And uh, same with the onions, the onions caramelize. And uh, another big surprise, who knew that you could roast chickpeas? And they are really wonderful. They get all crispy on the outside. They're just like these wonderful crispy bits. And also croutons, you know, who doesn't like croutons? So you make them buttery and garlicky and you toss them in. And it is just a delicious winter one pan dinner. So how come this is so good for the earth? Well, this wouldn't be a slideshow if there wasn't a picture of a globe. Here's my globe picture. And here's my idea of paradise. Um, so eating meals that are rich with plants and that are locally grown and are made of whole foods are good for the planet um, because they take less fossil fuel and resources to grow and transport and package and store. They are kind of lower on the food chain and um, the lower on the food chain you go, the um, less resources it takes to produce the food. So vegetables are fabulous, um, fish are good, chickens, wonderful, um, and so on. Fruit, mushrooms, yeah. So um, I'm eating like this is really good for humans too. So there is a, um, the food pyramid has, has been rethought and uh, you know, it used to be different, but now um, nutritionists feel that um, a diet of that's two thirds vegetables, mushrooms and greens, uh, one sixth protein and one sixth grain or potatoes is pretty close to ideal for humans for health. And turns out it's pretty close to ideal for the planet as well. So isn't that wonderful? Um, it's got a great balance of protein, plants, carbs, huge variety. And the thing is, is that our bodies want variety. It's, they're built for variety. We are omnivorous. So we get to eat what, you know, so many different things. And, and to eat the same vegetables over and over again isn't giving us variety that we deserve. I mean, it's, there are so many different flavors. There are so many different flavors of grains. I mean, most, most of us just stick to, you know, wheat, rice, corn, that's about it, right? But there are, you know, obviously oats. There's this wonderful form of wheat called farro. There's all different kinds of rice. 
there's barley, there's quinoa, and each one has different kinds of nutrition, phytonutrients, micronutrients, and uh, they're all really, really good for us. Protein can take so many different forms, uh, not just meat. Uh, beans are very high protein. Lentils are very, very high. Tofu's great. Rethink tofu. I know lots of people don't like it, but it's custardy. So if you put a nice sauce on it, make it kind of crunchy, it really becomes delicious. Give it another try. Um, and plenty of other different sources of protein. And plants that are, meals that are rich with plants are also really good for communities. They support local farms, um, they support the local economy. Um, farms make our, make our countryside beautiful and we need those farms in case the food chain fails. We saw all kinds of uh, scarcity during the pandemic and you know, people who had local farms around had a bit of insurance, people who grew their own gardens, people who knew how to forage. And uh, it's, it's really nice to know that we have these fallbacks available. I mean, I love eating oranges in the winter. Ah, a satsuma or, you know, a Clarabelle orange, they're so great. We don't have to quit eating that stuff entirely, but if we eat more locally grown food, um, it's gonna be better for our local farmers. It's really fun to wait until strawberries are in season because then it becomes like this strawberry fest, you know? You haven't had them for ages and they're local and they're fresh and they're warm from the sun and it makes them really, really special. So um, that is part of square meal deal. Um, so the footprint of food. This is to show how much changing the way we eat can affect our footprint. Changing up the way we cook and eat is the most effective thing that we can do as individuals to help reduce global warming. So I'm gonna show you a very quick little infographic that shows how much this means. So here is the standard American diet. Three-fifths meat and dairy, and half is highly processed foods, half of the entire diet, and only one-tenth is whole vegetables and fruits. And sadly, mostly that's like potatoes and tomatoes. Nothing against potatoes and tomatoes, but a little variety would be nice. Now, what about a plant-rich meal? Add more fruits, veggies, whole grains to the meal, and that naturally reduces the amount of uh, livestock-based uh, food, um, reduce the amount of red meat, eat more chicken, fish, dairy, and let's see how that affects the effect of these meals on the environment. Eating a plant-rich meal results in almost two tons of CO2 per emissions per year. The standard American diet, 2.5 tons. So even just reducing the amount of meat and dairy that you eat by, what is it, about 20%? results in a 20% reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, pretty amazing. A pretty amazing deal for a pretty small change. So how do we get there? How do we make it? I'm gonna quickly go through some instructions um, and graphics. You can get this recipe online at turningthetablescookbook.com. Preheat your oven to 400. Convection mode saves energy. By the way, and cooks faster, you can reduce your temperature to 375 if you use convection. And oh, it makes beautiful roasted food. So you prep your ingredients, you cut them up into the right sizes, you cut them up into however you like. This is, this is a fun part to me. Um, sharpen your knife and have some fun. So you add the longest cooking time ingredients to your pan first. 
And how do you know? How do you know what takes longer? There is a very handy table with the restaurant that gives, with the recipe that gives you all kinds of options for different ingredients and tells you how long they take to cook. So you've got your longest cooking ingredients there. You add a little bit of oil, you add some salt, you add some herbs, you stir, and then you spread it one layer deep. Put it in the oven, set a timer, check it every 10 minutes, add and remove ingredients as they cook till everything is totally toasted to your satisfaction. Enjoy your roasted dinner. So good. So for this uh, sheet pan dinner, we're gonna be using Brussels sprouts. There they are. They are from my fridge. They've been in there for a while, some of them. So I'm gonna trim them up. I'm gonna take off the outer leaves that are yellow or maybe withering brown. And I'm saving all these bits in a bowl because they're gonna go into my compost pile and become beautiful, rich, loamy soil for my garden. So everything goes in there. Um, you can also use lots of vegetable pairings uh, to make uh, soup stock. Um, cabbage, maybe not such that, you know, cabbage related foods, maybe not quite such good uh, ingredients for soup stock, but um, carrots are wonderful, onion skins, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of just uh, cleaning these all up and cleaning and cleaning. It's amazing the dexterity that our fingers are capable of, even those of us who are a little awkward. Uh, a sharp knife really helps. Um, uh, contrary to popular belief, you're, not, you're less likely to get cut, not more likely when you have a sharp knife. Uh, so there we go, um, cleaning them, cleaning them getting them all done. Now I put a sheet of parchment down on my baking uh, pan because that'll help with cleanup and it can be composted afterward. Um, sorting these out, some of them are different sizes. Some are quite a bit bigger than others. So I'm putting the small ones on whole and I'm gonna cut the big ones in half. So on they go, a little bit of sorting here, a little bit of cleanup, and then we go on to the carrots. Um, peeling the carrots, again, you can save those uh, pairings for soup stock um, and clean up the ends. This is, these are kind of like very unmatched carrots from my fridge. Um, cleaning these all up. Here comes the last one, got them all in there. And now it's time to cut the carrots. Now there's a few different ways you can cut carrots. One of my very favorite cuts is one I learned uh, from a Japanese cookbook, which is you give uh, cylindrical vegetables a quarter turn each time, and then you slice it on an angle, and it makes these beautifully random pieces um, that are each different. And I don't know, there's something I really love about that, but you can also, cut carrots into beautiful discs. You can cut them into ovals if you cut them on an angle. You can cut them into little sticks. Uh, you can even grate them. And they are so delicious roasted. They get very sweet and oh, just wait, you're gonna love them. So getting those all done, 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 cleaning them up. And now for potatoes. So I've got these little red potatoes um, that are so good. Um, and we want to dry them before we put them on. There's my poodle, my, my vintage poodle towel I got at a yard sale, um, glaze-eyed poodles. And I'm drying these guys up because they roast, things roast better if they're, if they're fairly dry on the surface. If they're too wet, they'll steam and they won't get that beautiful brownness. So on those potatoes go, they're gonna go on whole. And uh, now time to cut some onion. It's nice to keep the root end of the onion intact because it'll hold uh, these wedges that we're going to cut together. Um, I like to roll the onion a little bit on my cutting board. It loosens the skin up a bit. 
which can be, you know, a little ticklish to take off. Um, so cutting the onions, peeling them, cutting them into wedges, and just tossing them onto that sheet. Next ingredient, sausages. Um, I'm trying two different kinds of sausages out here. They're both pre-cooked. One is chicken and the other is a, um, a vegetarian sausage, um, which was pretty good. Eh, I don't know. I like the chicken sausage better. Now there's everything on our sheet pan. Now, with, ex with the exception of the sausage. So here's the thing is when you're cooking on a sheet pan, you want everything to be in a single layer and not too much touching because it's the air around those vegetables that makes them roast so beautifully. So um, make sure to give your uh, veggies plenty of space, your ingredients, um, and uh, spread them all out. And uh, if you're using two pans, you can put things together that are similar if you like, um, cook in the same amount of time. Uh, you know, there's all different ways you can do this. And, and really, it's very forgiving. Sheet pan cooking is so forgiving. Um, you can really afford to like, you know, experiment and everything's gonna be okay. Because, you know, if you start to see it's cooking too fast and it's burning, you can just pull the pan out and uh, take those particular bits off. Uh, so you add a little bit of oil and then you add some seasoning, salt and pepper. And this is where you might add any kind of like seasoned salts or something. See, just a little bit of oil, not so much. A Couple of tablespoons per sheet. Add a nice big pinch of salt and pepper. I like fresh ground pepper, but any kind of pepper is good in my book or not. Um, and then this is when you'd add maybe some seasoned salt if you have it, you know, or some dried spice blend, you know, if you, if you have something interesting that's been hanging out in your, in your spice rack or, you know, that you've been wanting to try, um, this is a good place to do it. Get it all stirred up and uh, then it's basically ready for your hot oven. I've separated things here a little bit. And now it's uh, on the second pan going in. I am not putting the sausages in yet because they're already pre-cooked, so they're not gonna take very long. So while those are in the oven, I'm gonna make a pesto to go along uh, with um, my finished dish. So these are, this is just a bunch of uh, parsley. I know lots of people think of parsley as very common and uninteresting, but in fact, I find it delicious. And especially if you mix it with a little garlic and a little oil and some salt, it is just stupendous. It is just stupendous. So um, here we go. I'm just chopping it up roughly. It's been washed, a little bit wet. That's okay, no big deal here. And I am just gonna pop it into um, this uh, cup so that it's ready for the stick blender. And uh, you can of course use a regular blender, you could use a food processor, you could even just chop these herbs finely and, uh, and it would all make a delicious pesto. And one nice thing uh, about pestos is that you can also use the stem, which you often don't use if you're just you know, using the leaves. So I'm adding a little bit of basil. Uh, this is basil that I grew in my garden last summer and at the end of the season, I dried it. It has much fresher flavor uh, than basil that you would buy in a jar at a store and it's a whole lot less expensive. And, uh, and you know, you have the pleasure of, of uh, having dried it yourself. You can do this with um, fresh herbs that you also buy at the market using some extra virgin olive oil, but really you can use all different kinds of oil. I like sunflower oil here, or, you know, regular vegetable oil is, is even good. So got that going on there. And um, now I am going to blend it. So taking the blender, got it going on there. You know, you might need to add a little bit of uh, 
oil or water to loosen things up a bit if it's getting too stiff. Keep tasting. Tasting's going to tell you whether you've got your seasonings just right. There we go. Getting that cleaned off. And I'm going to take a little taste. Really good. Now I'm going to just um, put that in a little bowl so that it's ready to serve alongside our roasted sheet pan meal. And there it goes. Um, you can use any herb for a pesto. You can add garlic, you can add chives, you can add, you know, shallot. Um, you can add different kinds of nuts if you like. Um, you know, really the sky's the limit. You can make pesto with kale. You can make a delicious pesto with kale and garlic. It's pretty surprising. So there, there we go. There's our pesto. Now, pulled this out of the oven after 10 minutes. I'm checking it out, whether it's done. The potatoes are actually pretty tender already. The carrots are still pretty firm. I'm just gonna stir it up a bit and uh, pop it back in. Just making sure to stir it and uh, starting to look nice. The uh, Brussels sprouts are starting to get a little brown. And uh, also you'll find if you have uh, two pans in the oven, um, one pan may get browner than the other depending on its position. Uh, generally the pan that's higher in the oven uh, gets a little more cooked. So um, here we go. It's going to go back in. And uh, going to pull the other one out. go stirring up that other one see this was on the top shelf and you can see it's kind of a little bit browner than the one that I just put in so that's looking pretty good there's I left extra space on that one because that's where the um, sausage is going to go so now here's another 10 minutes you can see it's really getting nice and toasty looking now those Brussels sprouts are getting browned the carrots are starting to get browned back in it goes so the one laborious thing about this is you do need to check since the oven is so hot you're going to want to set your timer and check these every you know 10 minutes or so so there we go this is at i think 20 minutes and now i'm adding these sausages um scattering them about looking good um love love those browned um, onions and those succulent little potatoes. Mm, mm, mm. So there they all go in, going back in for their last go. And here we go. These are once again getting more and more browned, looking pretty good. You can see getting very toasty. Even if those Brussels sprouts get a little bit um, dark brown, they're going to taste delicious. And here we go, here's the finished um, uh, pan with the carrots and the onions and the sausage. And so now all we need to do is to um, pour this into our serving platter and on it goes. There's like this gorgeous roasted dinner. It's warm, it's juicy, it's got this delicious herbal sauce and uh, uh, is just aromatic and delicious comfort food. Here we go with the second pan. Now, believe it or not, three of us just gobbled this whole platter of food down. It was just so good. And most of it is vegetables. So, you know, we don't feel like we, it's not heavy. You don't feel like you've really pigged out, but you've had this really beautifully delicious hearty um, meal. And uh, here we go, everything's all nice. We're gonna toss those on there and um, arrange it. Got a vintage plate that I got when I was in college at a yard sale. Um, and there we go. Yum. Now, I want to show you 
how few dishes were needed to make this. We've got the cutting board, got a little cutting board, a knife, a flipper, a small knife, an extra plate. We've got that blender equipment. And, uh, and then we've got the, uh, the sheet pan, which has our nice parchment on it. Pull the parchment up, totally clean. So all you need to do is kind of give it a soapy rinse and everything's all cleaned up. And uh, so that is the sheet pan dinner demo. So I have made a crap ton of sheet pan dinners over the last year, just trying all kinds of things out. And um, it is a method that I, is going to be on massive rotation in my kitchen um, forever because it's just so good, so delicious, and, uh, and really good for body and soul. So try it and uh, let me know how it goes. Share your photos um, at turningthetablescookbook.com. Find more recipes there. There are also articles about, um, about food that you can um, find growing in your backyard or grow on purpose in your backyard. Um, and all kinds of other tips for cooking for a low carbon footprint. And keep your eye out for our cookbook, which we're working on. I'm hoping it will come out soon. So thanks for coming to this demo. For me, I'm Maria Reidelbach, and for Cornell Cooperative Extension, my partners, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Come visit. Thanks. Bye.